stay where you're at if you can raise your hand towards heaven. I believe that this is the hour in which the church needs to cry out. You know, I've been personally wrestling with some things that I've been seeing in online and I don't, I don't, I'm never going to make anything that I do political, but I've been hurt and disgusted by some things that I've been seeing as of late. And I, I want, a scripture that comes to mind is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where it talks about love. Love is patient. Love is not jealous, boastful, or proud, or rude. It does not demand its own way, nor is it irritable, nor it, keep, nor it keeps record of any being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but it rejoices whenever the truth wins out. And something that I feel like we need to pray for, and I'm, I'm glad Sister Paige did the, the song today about uh, crying out to God, Second Chronicles 714, because there has to be um, something that changes in our world. And again, uh, nothing, nothing that I say is, is political. I don't, I, it doesn't matter whether you're Republican or you're a Democrat. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. But what matters is that lives do matter. And so, again, I want us to pray together and cry out to God. But I pray, I ask you today, lift up your hands towards heaven and help me cry out to God. Lord Jesus, we come to you tonight, God. We are your church. We are your people. We are your body. Father, we come to you asking you, God, to help us, Lord. Help the church be the church, God. Help the church, God, demonstrate love in this hour, Lord. God, God, I pray that we would help manifest, God, the fruits of your spirit, Lord. Help us, Father, to do your work and do your will, Lord. As the song said earlier, Lord, to, for us to have a heart for the least of these, God. I pray today, Father, though we are blessed, though we are doing well, Father, help us to not forget those, God, that still are waiting and depending on us to help them, Lord. Help us today, God, to cry out for the right for righteousness. Help us to cry out for justice. Help Help us to love one another, God. Help us to love our neighbor as ourself. I pray, God, today that you would move in our hearts, God. Move in our churches. Move in our communities. Move in our leadership, God. I pray, Father, if anything in this season, bind us together. I pray in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen, amen, amen. Oh, God, God, we need you. God, we need you. Tonight, I, I truly feel feel like today's message or lesson is going to help us because we are in we are supposed to be growing in our spiritual walk with God and you know as you begin to develop in your faith you begin to go through three uh, dimensions or three virtues and and really this is what the Lord has been dealing with me personally to teach the church to teach the body and, and I believe that our ultimate goal of every believer is to live in the dimension of love. And we are to love our neighbor as ourselves, but we're also to love God uh, with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. But to get there, I think sometimes we need a path and, and a process and the steps to get to that place of maturity. And I believe that that's the level or the place that God wants to take us to. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13 Bible tells us three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And so today I want to talk to us on a part two of spiritual growth or spiritual maturity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful again for this opportunity that you give us to be able to gather together. Though we're gathered, we're also scattered. But Lord, we thank you, God, for your presence that we feel today. We pray, God, that you would give us a hungry heart to know your word, God, to live your word. We pray that you would touch our ears to hear your voice, to touch our minds to understand, to touch our hearts so that we can hide your word in it so that we don't sin against you. And help us, God, to live out in faith, by faith, what we hear today. We need you. We need your presence. We need your power. We need your glory. I pray, God, for our nation. I pray for our world. I pray for all of us today. God, in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. I began last week uh, quoting out of John, 1 John chapter 12, 2, verse 12 to 14. 
And John begins to write to his people, to the church, and he begins to tell them, I write to you, children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. And so as we see this passage of Scripture, we see that here John the Apostle is writing to the church and he's describing three groups of individuals, uh, children, uh, young men or young women, and fathers or mothers. We see here that there are three levels of believers. Number one is your child, the person who is newly involved in the faith, someone who is brand new to Christ, someone who's brand new and knowing who God is. The second one is young men, young person, young, young, young man, young woman. And this is not necessarily an age, but a level of maturity in their faith. And finally, there's the father or the mother who is at a point of spiritual maturity that is now mentoring and producing more like themselves. But another way to describe it would be through the parable that Jesus gives about the sowing of the seed where he talks to uh, those that are listening and he says there are 30-fold and there are 60-fold and there are 100-fold. And after we're born again, we fall into that category of 30-fold. We're children in the faith. We're learning how to maneuver our lives through uh, this area of faith. And so we're children trying to observe and look and understand and see what it is that we can do uh, so that we can grow and, and do in advance. And so that's the process of being a child in the faith, but eventually we move up to 60-fold where we become young men or young women in the faith, where we're more mature, we understand, we know things, and then there's finally a place where we find ourselves as a hundredfold uh, or fathers, spiritual fathers or spiritual mothers. And I believe that it is not God's will for a hundredfold to be the exce to, to be the exception, but rather that the hundredfold be the normality that every believer would mature to the place of being a father or a mother. Each level, though, has a corresponding virtue. So as you see 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, or you see child, young, and parent, you, there's also a corresponding virtue that would be attached or align itself with each level of faith. And so here's what we, we look at in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. The three levels that I would say are the three virtues or the three dimensions of 30, 60, 100, child, young, and parent would be this. Number one, hope. Hope is the level of the child or the 30-fold. Number two is faith. Faith is the level of the 60-fold or the young and then there's love, the level of a hundredfold or father and mother. Hope in the New Testament means an expectation of good to hope for. I have an expectation that this, something will happen. And hope is so powerful that when we hope in something, we will go to whatever extreme to ensure that we see it come to pass. But it is also as powerful as when we lose hope, it causes us to throw in the towel. Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope is strong enough to keep you going, but when hope is lost, one may give up. Hope is the level where a new believer or a child or 30-fold lives in. Hope, is, hope says, I Hope it happens. We are not really sure, but we're really hoping. We're crossing our fingers saying, let it be so. This is the level of a child, uh, in, in spiritual child. I hope I can make it. I hope I am saved. I hope it will happen. I hope I'll get my miracle. But then the moment that we see it not come to pass, we're quick to give up. We're quick to throw in the towel. And, and so we find ourselves going back and having to pick ourselves up and then continue to go forward. We live in that place of hope, that place where we struggle and only hope to see things come to pass. And I want us to look at a story 
of a man that had hope in, in, in Jesus. He had his hope in Jesus, but his hope in Jesus was completely wrong. You see, this man was, the name, was a man by the name of Peter. Peter, we know him as an apostle now. Uh, we know him as the man that spoke on the day of Pentecost and, and spoke so powerfully that 3,000 people that were listening gave their lives to God in that very moment. Peter wasn't always as strong. Peter wasn't always as bold for Christ. You see, at the beginning of his walk with the Lord, he understood or he thought he knew who Jesus was, so he gave everything up. He sold everything. He got rid of his stuff, whether, what, however he did it. He, he let go of his possessions for that season to follow Jesus. He had this expectation, this hope that he was going to fulfill a prophecy that he misunderstood. You see, his concept of what Jesus' mission was, was for him to overthrow Rome and reestablish the kingdom of Israel. When Jesus began to ask them, who do people say that I am? And some would say, you're, some say you're a prophet. Some say you're John the Baptist. And Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter stands up out of them, all, all of the 11 and says, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And what he was confessing at that moment was he was confessing that I believe you are the messianic promise. You are the messianic prophecy coming to life and you're going to do what I hope and expect for you to do to overthrow Rome and reestablish Israel. But Jesus begins to describe to him God's plan, how he must die on a cross and he must be buried, but on the third day he will rise again. Peter begins to say, no, Jesus, and he begins to rebuke Jesus, but, and he says, I'll die with you. You, you are not going to fight this fight alone, but Jesus rebukes him back and says, no, get behind me, Satan. you got to understand this is the perfect plan of God. Peter was still bold and said, I will never, I will always be with you, and Jesus tells him, no, you're going to deny me three times. Finally, the time comes, Jesus is arrested, and what happens? When the moment when Jesus is arrested, Peter tries to fight, but Jesus tells him, no, put your sword away. Hold on a second. This is fulfilling the plan of God. So at that moment, Peter runs off along with the other disciples. And, Peter, and so Peter takes off. And then as they take Jesus, they arrest him. They persecute him. They mistreat him. They abuse him. They hang him on the cross. And in that process, Peter denies Jesus three times like Jesus had spoken to him. Peter realized his failure. Peter realized that he had, he had done what Jesus had told him he would do. But he did it because his hope in Jesus or his, his own personal expectation in Jesus had fallen short. Hope deferred made his heart sick. And so what did he do? He ran off. He went back to his old job. He went back to his old life. He went back to the old way of doing things so that, so that he could just restart and regain everything that he thought he lost for three and a half years. Thankfully, Jesus went back and found him, called him out where he was staying as he was fishing for fish in a boat. And Peter, when he recognizes who Jesus is, jumps out of the boat, swims to Jesus, and at that moment, Jesus begins to speak a new purpose into his life. He begins to tell him, Peter, I know that you were only a child in the faith. I know that you were only 30-fold. I know that you weren't exactly where you needed to be, but I've come back to call you, to give you a new purpose, because I want you to elevate from a 30-fold to a 60 fold. I want you to move from simply having hope in your own perception of what this should look like, and I want you to move into a level of faith to believe that God's word is true and that God has a plan and a purpose. I believe that this is what God is wanting to speak to us today that there is power in hope, yes, absolutely, but at the same time, we can't always live our Christian life in this realm or this level of hope because. God truly wants us to mature. God truly wants us to grow. God wants us to be more than just hopeful people crossing our fingers, hoping that it will happen, it will come to pass. God wants us to go beyond the level of hope into a place of faith. 
I believe that God wants to mature us. But when we live in this place of hope, I hope I don't sin. I hope I don't fall into temptation. I hope I don't make the same mistake. I hope I don't go back to the world. I hope I don't fall short. I hope I don't go back to my sins. And so you begin to live in this mindset of hope. And at the beginning, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But God is calling his people to grow and to mature to a place to beyond hope and to a place called faith. God wants us to grow. From hope or 30-fold to 60-fold or a level of faith. Faith is conviction of the truth of anything. It's belief. It's having that conviction or belief that God is going to be faithful. It's believing with all confidence, with conviction. Hebrews 11.1 in the NIV version says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance for what we do not see. In other words, we have hope, but along with the hope, we have a conviction or we have confidence that though we can't see it, we believe it's going to come to pass. And so as we look at faith as a level of 60-fold, we live a life that we're convinced. We know temptation is going to come. We know that battles are going to come our way. We know storms will come our way. We know things will, will come in our direction. But because we, are, we have confidence in the word of God and in God himself, we have confidence even in our relationship and how far we've come. We move from a level of, I hope I don't fall short. I hope I don't sin to a place where we're confident saying, I can take this mountain. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When we begin to live in the level of faith, we walk with confidence. We walk with authority. We walk with the anointing of God on our life. Unlike hope, we aren't living on a maybe, but we are convinced. We don't just cross our proverbial fingers anymore, but now we stand firm. We stand tall. We stand confident because we know that God is with us. We understand that we are strong in the faith. First John chapter 2, verse 14 says, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. You have overcome the wicked one. Amen. And Romans 10, 17, New King James Version says, So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Psalms 119, 11 says, I have hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Again, here you see for us to move from the level of hope. And the level of hope, we're not really reading our Bibles. We're not really praying. We're, we're barely getting our feet wet in things that are spiritual. But as we mature, and I pray that we're maturing, as we read our word, as we begin to pray, as we begin to seek the face of God, we move from a place of hope to a place of confidence in God, understanding his word, knowing that we are overcomers, knowing that we have triumphed over the enemy knowing that we have uh, the victory why because we are more than conquerors in Christ but all this happens because we begin to hide his word in our heart we begin to have confidence in what the Bible tells us we begin to live by faith we live by faith and not by sight as you look at the story of Abraham Abraham walked in faith He trusted God. He trusted God. He was living in the level of 60-fold. He trusted God. James 2.18, the New King James Version says, But someone will say to you, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. In other words here, it's not enough to just say we have faith, because if we have faith, but there's moments where we fall, we're still living in that dimension of hope. But God is calling us, and he's telling us to reach further, and to go higher, and to go wider, and to go to a place where we can truly walk in the confidence with God. Now, doesn't mean that we walk in stupidity either. Again, we gotta be smart. We gotta be wise. We gotta go with our eyes open. But at the same time, we have to walk in the confidence that God is with us. That's the second level 
That's the place of the 60-fold. And I believe that we see a big amount of 30-fold Christians. We have Christians that have been serving the Lord but are still celebrating the fact that hey, I'm saved. I'm glad I'm saved. And, and yet they, they don't mature beyond the fact that they're saved. I write to you, children, because you are saved. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and you have overcome the wicked one. But I believe that now that is important. God wants us to have hope, always hope for the best. God wants us to have faith and have confidence in God and his word. The greater calling in our faith with God and our greater calling in our relationship with God is not hope, it's not faith, but it's love. Love means affection, goodwill, love, benevolence. Living in love is living in 100-fold. And so Jesus was asked by a Pharisee. He was asked and he asked the question, uh, teacher, what's the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus responds this way, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now, we can say, well, I love God. I go to church. I, I read my Bible. I pray. Great. That's fantastic. That's the will of God. But Jesus went on to say, this is the first and greatest commandment. But the second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. It's in love that God's commandments hang on. If you begin to live a life of love, loving God, you'll do what God wants. And if you begin to live in a level of loving your neighbor as yourself, you will treat people differently because you're living in a dimension of love. And when we live in the level of love, we know God's word and it guides us, but we tend to live at a higher level. So God's law of love or the level or the dimension or the virtue of love is so much higher than the level of faith and even law. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 to 22 says, you have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder and if you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But look what Jesus said. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. Here is what God is trying to get us to understand. That yes, we must hope for great things. Yes, we must walk in the faith in the word of God. The word of God told us if you commit murder, it's an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a life for a life. But Jesus said, I don't even want you to think that far ahead. I want you to begin to think, consider that even if you're upset at your neighbor, it's like if you've committed murder and you're worthy of judgment itself. That's love. I know I'm talking to some husbands and wives right now. Hey, man, love your neighbor, love your wife, love your husband. Matthew 5, 27, 28, Jesus goes on to give a little bit more explanation. It says, you have heard the commandment that says, you must not commit adultery. But I say to you, anyone who even looks at a woman with, the lust, with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. You see, we are to live beyond the law. When we live in faith, we live in faith obeying God's law, obeying God's command. We have overcome the wicked one because of his word. But Jesus is saying, I don't want you to just overcome the wicked one because of the word of God that's in you. I want you to overcome any temptation because I want love to live in you. The word gives a direct order. The Bible gives a direct order. Love keeps us from even getting close to violating God's law. We need love for both God and our neighbor. When we become parents, we change. Now we do things for the sake of our children. Why? Because we love them. There's things that I do now that I didn't do before because of my children. 
There's precautions that I take now that I didn't take before because I have children, because I need to protect my children, because I live in a level of love. 1 John chapter 2.13 says, I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. When we live in the level or dimension of love, we become spiritual fathers and mothers. We aren't simply living for ourselves anymore, but we live our lives for others. When we live in love, I don't just live for me. I live for you. I live so that you can be saved. I live so that I can be an example for you. I live so that you can make it when the trumpet sounds. I live for you. Paul said, let love be your highest goal. 1 Corinthians 14.1 Love equals 100-fold. Love equals father or mother in the faith. So what does love look like? What does it look like? And this is what I read earlier today, and I want to share again. If I could speak the languages of earth and of angels, but I did not love others, I would only be a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but did not love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my own body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous, boastful, or proud, or rude. It does not demand its own way It's not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice in injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. Is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in tongues and special knowledge will become useless. But love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete. And even the gift of prophecy reveals only in part the whole picture. But when it comes time of perfection, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I had reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. And all that I know is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely just as God knows me completely. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. As we look at 1 Corinthians 13, 13, three things will last forever. Faith, hope, love. The greatest is love we will be able to identify where we are spiritually, what level we're living at, 30, 60, or 100, by how or what dimension we live in, whether it's hope, I hope I can make it, I hope I'm saved, I hope I don't fall short, faith, bless God, I'm going to make it. I know the word of God. I'm going to do everything, cross every T and dot every I. I'm going to live the word of God by faith and love. That says, because I love, I will, or because I love, I won't. There are three levels, hope, faith, and love. And as the Apostle Paul said, for our aim, for our goal, For our desire should be living in the level of love. As the musicians come tonight, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you today. I don't know where you are in your walk with God, but I know that God is calling all of us to move from a place 
to move from a level of hope, 34, child, to a place of faith. That should be our next step if we're living in the 30-fold. A place of young. A place of faith. But then we should always, if we're living at that level, always try to take the next step forward to live in the level of love. When we learn to live in the level or the dimension of love, things begin to change in our lives. I don't do things because I hope I make it to heaven. I don't do things because bless God, this is what the word of God says. But I do things because it pleases my Lord and it benefits my neighbor. Tonight, Paul is calling us, but more than Paul, the Lord is calling us to let love be our highest goal. I pray tonight that you, that me, would lay aside every weight, that we would learn to obey the commands of Jesus. He said, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Tonight, there where you're at, if you can lift up your hands towards heaven. Lord, I'm sorry if I haven't loved you the way you want me to. God, you know my heart. You see my heart. You see my level of faith. And I'm grateful, Lord, that you don't condemn me for my shortcomings. You keep no record of wrong. But God, you are merciful. You are gracious. You are loving. And so tonight, I know that you're calling us, God, to love you with everything that we possess. But not only do you want us to love you with all that we have, but you want us to love our neighbor as ourself. Help me, God, to love my brother, to love my sister. Help me, God, to love the stranger. Help me, God, to love those that are least, those that are far from you, those that don't even want anything to do with you. Help me to love those that are walking the streets today. Help me to love those, God, that I don't agree with. Help me to love those, God, that I see eye to eye with and those, God, that, oh my goodness, I just want to, I just want to not be nice to them. Help me, God to love, to live in the dimension of love. Help God for love to be my highest goal. I pray this today in the name of Jesus. There in your home as they begin to sing, I pray that you would begin to talk to the Lord in Jesus' name. I need you. You need
let love, let love be your highest goal. Let it be what we strive for. Let it be what we reach for. Let it be our highest goal. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're so grateful that you did. I got a few announcements to make, and it's in regards to this coming Sunday. We are excited, if you didn't get to hear the announcement on Sunday, that this Sunday we are opening our doors. That this Sunday we're going to get together for Pentecost Sunday to lift up the name of Jesus together and to bless his holy name. So I'm excited to be united with the people of God. So I want to encourage you to come, but come early. Tap your neighbor and tell them, come early, come early, come early. Because we're going to see God move in a powerful way. Now we're going to have some guidelines in place, and you'll be hearing a little more about that here in the next couple of days. But service will be at 11 o'clock. We will be having an outdoor service, and we will be combining with Arbo de Vida. Come expecting God to move in a powerful way. Come expecting God to fill someone with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Come expecting God to do something great and powerful on Sunday morning in Jesus' name. So come, invite your friends, invite your family. It's going to be amazing in Jesus' name. But come early. Doors are going to open at 1030, and, uh, and it's going to be amazing. So we love you. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.